My name is Richard Bilderbeek. I'm going to talk about open science, some pros, some cons, and the community. This presentation, you can find it here and in multiple places, and it's in the public domain because I care more about open science than about getting personal glory attached from this presentation. The goals of this talk is to discuss open science and to share the usefulness of an open science community. And I'll try to convince you with that. So I used to be in academia. Now I, like I've done nearly two postdocs. Um, now I'm in support and research support at Uppsala University in Sweden. I am the founder of the local open science community there called Open Science Uppsala. It's a bit of a dull name. And you can find my stuff on GitHub. And there you can find open source software, open teaching materials, open scientific articles, open access papers, those kind of things. It's there. I'm quite active there. And in this talk, there will be three little experiments. First, I'm going to talk about the cons, then the pros, and then about the community. And I'll call, the, they, they have like variables, and the values in those variables is how much do you enjoy that part? Uh, if you have the time to observe how much you enjoy this, because I'll be using it later. Experiment one is, here I search the literature. And we're going to search for the biggest drawbacks of open science for a researcher today. And for that, I search the literature for five hours, which is about the same time I spent at the community. Uh, I collect all those results and I rank these. So I've done that and I'll show you, uh, so I've ranked them, this is a, a personal thing. So I'll just go, um, so there are some least relevant things. There are some things that may be relevant, but I will only be focusing on the most relevant things. And this is what it resulted in. And you see that, so this is, these are all like different papers. And, um, and you can imagine that the paper comes back multiple times, for especially paper two. Um, it's about open science, the pros and cons of it. So you find that one back. And what we see uh, here is that uh, the smileys, what they indicate is the nerd phase means uh, that I already knew this. I've, I've seen this at the open science community. Uh, in Uppsala, and the thinking means that these are new things that I didn't see in a presentation there yet. So let's go through them. Open si open data excludes or excludes or inconveniences the industry. I'll talk about that later. Lack of standards for sharing research materials. Yes, that is a problem. I already knew about that. Open infrastructure is not always in place yet. I knew that because I've seen people working on that. Open data. Uh, for example, making it fair takes more time. I know this because I've seen people working on that. Um, I do know that sharing sensitive data is more complex, but I've never seen a talk about this per se, and like spo specialized at Open Science Uppsala. That these methods take more time doing a pre-registration or a registered report, or in general, reproducible science takes more time. Yes, but I've never seen this clearly in a in a talk. And there are no clear legal guidelines on open data. I have to believe that, that it's not clear. I do understand that there are no sanctions. So if you say that your data is, is, is private for two years, then if you don't open it up after those two years, there are no, there are no sanctions you can get. You can just get away with it. So you can always say, I will open up my data later and nothing will happen when you don't. So that was a new insight for me. Um, maybe only that one uh, is the new insight for me. So this is the result of my literature search. My second part of the experiment is about the literature I already knew, uh, because I've obviously been searching literature more often. And the research question is, what are my favorite papers on open science that I already know? So, uh, and I just copy paste those from earlier presentation pre presentations I gave myself um, and those for that I searched the literature. So how, how enjoyable is that? Well, one of my favorite papers is this one from Manavo, um, the Manifesto for Reproducible Science. And they, they identify the threats to reproducible research. I care a lot about reproducible research. And here we see a picture um, which has a hypothesis-driven research, and the boxes are 
uh, threats to making this reproducible. Um, this, pap this figure, there exists a version with inflated numbers, that means it makes regular science look even worse. Uh, this is the corrected one if you do read the paper, so to be careful to use the, the right picture. So for example, threats is that only one in a hundred papers is reproduced. We use low statistical power. Uh, we do p-value hacking. Uh, so this means that you look for p-values that are significant in multiple ways. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And we, do, we don't publish everything. That we lack data sharing. And we do harking. And harking means hypothesis after results are known. And again, hypothesis after results are known. So when you know the results, you start hypothesizing. So this means if you find, if you start your research with hypothesis A, and you get your data in, then you think of a different hypothesis that fits the story better, that will fit your results better. This is a type of storytelling. And what you do is you write down the alternative hypothesis, the new hypothesis, as if that was where you started with. Quite prevalent. And I think all these things make me realize, yes, regular science is a problem. And what I like best about open science is that it helps honest reporting. And this is um, sometimes called the file drawer problem. And so the file drawer problem is when you do a, like, a, a, like a regular research and you find no result. And sometimes, look, this is a valid finding. If you do a treatment, do a treatment on something, then sometimes it has no effect, and we should publish that. But people don't get it published, and they can multiple read one. One part of this is that they say, "Well, I probably can't get it published. I'll keep it in my file drawer," and that's why it's called the file drawer problem. And it's a problem because then multiple people will try this out and also find nothing. And another facet of this is that it's being called being held hostage by your data. So being held hostage by your data, that means that you are you you feel that if it's not significant, if there's no effect, uh, you can't publish it. So you depend on what you're going to find, and that's an unhealthy situation to be in. Whereas if you do a registered report, and a registered report, for those that know, don't know, is is a is a type of publication in which you describe your methods and your analysis and your conclusion and your discussion even before you have the actual data and that will be reviewed and if your experiment makes scientific sense then a journal may, will say to you dear scientist you go ahead and do it and whatever comes out of it will publish it and then we see suddenly a big increase in the amount of times we find nothing. And I really love this, that we can do honest report, that we can be honest about what we find. Another one of my favorite papers is that open science results in better papers. So in this study, they compared um, re regular papers with registered reports. So this registered report is when, when you write down your analysis and you're already before you have the data. And at the right hand side means that the registered reports do better. They asked reviewers to score papers. They didn't know what they were scoring, like what the research question was. But they had to score some papers on, for example, methods rigor. And then find out that registered reports score a full point on a nine point record scale uh, more higher than, than classic papers. And one of my other favorite things of this paper is the creativity of the methods. Like some people say that registered reports limit creativity. Well, this paper gives you no evidence of it. It says that either, if you're very precise, that there's it has the same amount of creativity in the methods, or you could say that there's some a little hint that it is more creative. That is registered reports. So the other things, I won't go into details about that. Instead, I'm going to go talk about the community. So these are my favorite. These have been my favorite papers, um, and, the and it ha yeah, I think these are very interesting. Experiment three is: What are the pros and cons of open science for research today? 
And for this, I'm going to visit the meetings that we had, or I, in my case, I've remembered the meetings. And I'm going to select my favorites, and I'm going to share those with you, the insights I got from our community. So the Open Science Uppsala community, that's in Uppsala, obviously. Um, and would this not be a YouTube video, I would ask you who lives in the town with the local community, and who had visited them at least once. Open Science Uppsala has the following goals or facets. Um, most of us are not into open science. I think all of us are not into open science, as in we're not researching open science on its own. We try to use it and discuss and teach each other the pros and cons of it. We do this in English. Uh, although we're in Swedish, we feel English is the more inclusive language. We do this every month. Everyone is welcome that embraces the scholarly method. It is Uppsala, it's an Uppsala, it's for free. So that means we have no coffee or cookies because that make, brings cost. No, it's for free. And it's especially in a public place. So it takes place at a public library, not at the university, no, in the public library. So everyone can visit if they want. My statement is that searching the literature and visiting a community is more interesting or more useful then searching the literature and searching the literature again. So I will now talk about things I've learned at Open Science Uppsala or insights I've got. So what I didn't know, this is a talk by Barbro, is developing how to make data fair, the hassle of this. So she was uh, paid to set up those those methods, um, and this is this is a lot of work. But then also, like they, she had to. They, they, they used some kind of machines, and sometimes she took the machines, or that, that group took the machines to the researcher, and that's very convenient for the researcher, obviously. But also, sometimes the researcher needed to visit the facility to have their uh, cultural things measured, and I'm. So this this also shows that it don't, it takes. This it proves that it takes time to make your data fair. Uh, and I'm happy people do it, but it's it's more work. What I learned from Martin at Open Science Uppsala is that openness may be unfair to companies. We don't always want open data because sometimes we want companies. Um, sometimes companies can be built around a non-shareable resource. For example, uh, Martin he's into agriculture, so he, for example, if you have bread and an ex excellent cow or sheep. Then you don't want to share it. No, you want to keep it and sell it. And it would be unfair if you would be forced to share that resource. What I learned from Douglas is that open source software alleviates uh, constraints. So he develops open software that is very useful. It's about ambulance predictions, how to use ambulance in the best way using a machine learning. And because he makes it open source, free and open source, um, he can bypass all this demo, th this bureaucracy around institutions and culture, and get his useful software used, um, because it's open, free and open source software. And um, it was interesting to see how he just got, he, how he just did it. But they learned at Open Science Uppsala is that qualitative research is different. So here we have Anna Halberg, and she was a political science scientist. And I learned from her that using replication as a measure of quality, and that's what, what I usually do, I'm in a field uh, where we think replication and reproducible research is very important, but replication does not make sense for qualitative papers. As an example she gave is, what is democracy. So this would be a paper that discusses what is a democracy, how should it represent the the, the, the people, in, in which ways, when do we call democracy yes or no. So that would be a theoretical exercise or qualitative. And those fields, they need to be judged differently. What I've learned at Open Science Uppsala was from Ismail. He says, well, that citizen science can really help uh, because when we do our papers, we usually do cohort studies with a lot of people in it, and then we, we clump them up. 
and achieve, but achieving that statistical power ignores the individual. And citizen science can help the few individuals that have a strong effect by some treatment, like it's more individualized. What I learned from Adam is a technique, it was about uh, a peer review, but he showed me a technique called specification curve analysis and will allow you to do a pre-registered study with some kind of statistics in it but you keep your statistical power and this was completely new to me and I'll show you uh, the study so the study they well it was more like the exercise study the paper discussed is about um, hurricane names so hurricanes they have a name uh, we know how many people they kill and we know all the things like the year, the wind speed, and the pressure. And let's say your hypothesis is that the name of a hurricane is a predictor of the amounts of death it will give. We know this is a nonsense hypothesis, but we can test that. And especially what they did is they, 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 just, they checked if the name was male or female. And may, because maybe male hurricanes cause more deaths or the other way around. But you can do that in many, many ways. So there are some decisions that they made. So here you see a, a part of a table from that paper. For example, you could say, well, maybe we should analyze all storms or exclude the outliers. Maybe we should, um, maybe we should do a rating of femininity in the names. But you could also say, well, maybe we should classify names only as male or female. So what we see here is that there are multiple ideas how to do the study, how to um, which decisions, which statistical decisions you make, and there are so many. They will they done more than eleven hundred of those options, but you need to pick one. You need to pick one before you do your actual research. If you do a registered report, you need to write down your method. And that is a problem because how do you know of 1100 if you picked the right one? Maybe you picked a weird one. And you could say, well, I just do all 1100 of them and then I do a, a Bonferroni correction on those 1100 uh, tests because else you get false positives. Well, that's a bad idea because you lose statistical power. So the idea is you pick a specification but you also um, show how representative this is, how of an outlier it is. And then you can use your regular statistical uh, power. You don't need to change your alpha value. Um, and you do get an idea of how representative it is. So this is how it looks like. Um, here they have, uh, at the x-axis, you, you see 300 of the 1728 tests they done. That it's randomly sampled from those. At the y-axis, you see the number of additional deaths predicted from the hurricane name, especially being, being masculine. And these, each of these blue dots is the amount of deaths predicted when it's not significant. And when it's a black dot, it is significant. So 8 out of 300 times, we found a significant effect. Um, and the big dot was the, the, the specification they got. So would they have had a significant effect? They didn't. Then you would say, well, uh, maybe it is not significant anyways. Maybe this was a weird choice we made. So that's what I learned at Open Science Uppsala. But the most favorite thing about what I learned about Open Science Uppsala is from Gustav Nilsson. So he was the first speaker of us. He's known at, uh, he's mostly known for his work, I think, at OSF, the Open Science Foundation. Um, and he's most involved in badges. So he wants to make open science more visible by allowing badges on researchers and papers, for example a badge for reproducibility and a badge for um, everything. So it makes more visible how well you do as a, in your open science things. And he showed me a paper that even if the data is open, different teams can draw opposite conclusions with high confidence and this proves to me that science is even more complex 
than it is, we may not be ready for it. It makes interpreting results even harder, and we can only sh do this when doing open science. So this is the, the, the study. Uh, so the data was a uh, brains. You see brains here, um, and you see activity in brain areas. And they gave the, the hypothesis they've used. There were nine hypotheses, all of the type of there is an increase or decrease in some kind of brain area between a treatment A and B. So there are two treatments and and uh, there may be an effect, yes or no, in the brain area, yes or no. And he asked to run 40 different teams to say if the hypothesis is true or false, all based on the same data. And ideally you would expect that all scientists think, well, this is definitely true or false and that all research teams agree on this. This is false. Here we see, this is the figure from the paper, at the x-axis you the hypothesis number, so those are, th those are the nine hypotheses. At the y-axis you see team ID, so it's a bit anonymized here, there are about 40 teams. And we see that for example for hypothesis 1, that teams disagree um, if the hypothesis is true or false. So when a team thinks it's true, that hypothesis it's green. And when a team thinks the hypothesis is false, they score it with red. Well, see, we already see a big diversity, a big difference of opinions from research teams about if something is true or false based on the same data. And it's even worse if you zoom in a bit on the data because they are also very confident in this. So here we see two teams. Uh, uh, this is also a subset of that table. For hypothesis two, the second team thinks it's false with the highest certainty possible. Whereas the fourth team said hypothesis 2 is true with the highest possible confidence. So this means science is way more complex than I already thought. And open science can help us show this if you can just only honestly report those findings. We can find out how science is more complex and we should not put this under the rug. So we should never, f we should not forget that there is another community, which is this community. And I know last week, uh, last time, uh, Pia she showed uh, among others these graphs. So this is this is her, um, uh, this is where you can find it. And really enjoy um, the a poll about I think 600 people that visit these lectures. What are the main obstacles in open science? And what I uh, I see here is that that only the missing infrastructure has been discussed by Open Science Uppsala. All the others our community has not discussed yet. Um, and most of these things I have already showed you reference of the literature too in this talk. And this thing is, is a bit missing in both regards. And I think it would be interesting to zoom in on, on this finding, like what exactly is meant here by our fellow researchers. To conclude my talk, I hope to have convinced you that the literature and the community is better than reading the literature or more literature. Because I've showed you, st I started with when I read more literature. And I think that's quite was quite a dull part of my talk. Because you already knew most of it anyways, probably, at least I did. Um, like sure, I read the literature before. I showed you my favorite papers, but that was equal. Um, but I think that the, 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 the community papers have showed you that's way broader than I have searched the literature for. It's way more fun and interesting than the literature search I did, I did too in equal amount of time. And also this place where we are now is a community where we should help each other find the pros and cons of open science. If there are any questions, well, this is a YouTube video, so you can't answer me questions, but this way you can find the presentation. Instead, I wish you a very good day. Bye.